Kia ora everybody, good afternoon. We're now on day five of our nationwide COVID-19 Alert Level 4 lockdown. So I want to start today uh, with a very big thank you to everybody who is staying at home, staying in their bubble and contributing to our nationwide effort to once again stop the virus in its tracks. Delta is here and it is trying to move fast. People who have been at locations of interest or contacts of positive cases are spread throughout New Zealand, so we are all in this together. But we've beaten COVID-19 before, and we can do it again if we all continue to play our part. Shortly, I'll ask the Director General to run through the latest details of COVID-19 cases in the community. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about masks and record keeping and some decisions that the Cabinet has taken there. I will work through some more of the support government's putting in place for essential workers uh, to help relief teachers and casual staff in schools, uh, and of course on schooling itself under Alert Level 4. But first, uh, to start with good news, as it has become my tradition, I do want to note a couple of very significant milestones in our vaccination programme. After a record day for the programme on Friday, where 56,843 doses were delivered, yesterday we reached a new record for a weekend day, with over 50,000 doses delivered yesterday. And today we celebrate one million New Zealanders being fully vaccinated against COVID-19. I want to say I'm incredibly impressed with the health workforce in New Zealand. They've stepped up right across the country, particularly in Auckland, doing testing, vaccination and supporting people through our hospitals. They continue to deliver incredible numbers that we can be proud of. I also want to acknowledge our pharmacies, our GPs, our haora providers who have been really ramping up their vaccination and testing to meet the current needs. Yesterday, 52,106 doses of the Pfizer vaccine were delivered. 36,478 of those were people entering the vaccination programme for the first time. 102,243 new bookings were made yesterday. That means that 73% of New Zealanders over the age of 40 have either had at least one dose of the vaccine or are now booked in to get one. drive through vaccination centres are being stood up around the country as DHBs uh, put in place their alert level 4 vaccination plans. They're a very good way for people to be vaccinated quickly and safely. The largest of those centres is in South Auckland. That opened this morning. It has a capacity to be able to deliver 2,000 vaccinations per day. I'm told that so far they've been doing so well they've opened up space for another 1,000 appointments. You do still need to have a booking to go to a drive-through vaccination centre. And some centres have been reserved for our essential workers who we want to provide the opportunity to be vaccinated. So go on bookmyvaccine.nz to see the availability of vaccinations nearest to you. More good news, another 382,500 doses of the Pfizer vaccine arrived in New Zealand yesterday, meaning we have uh, over 750,000 doses on hand. So our vaccination program can scale up uh, without having to worry about running out. So if you're 40 plus or you're in one of our other priority groups and you haven't made a booking yet, visit bookmyvaccine.nz today and make sure that you reserve your spot. A quick reminder and a very, very important one. If you are a contact and you are self-isolating, you should not leave your house and that includes going to be vaccinated. If you have a booking, please call the vaccine booking number or go online to bookmyvaccine.nz to change or to delay your booking. If you are a contact and you are self-isolating, please do not go to a vaccination centre. You will be able to rebook. You will also be able to rebook if you are a contact of a community case. So uh, you should also avoid going to the supermarket or to the dairy uh, on your way home from going uh, and getting a COVID test. Uh, please get someone else to do your shopping for you and to deliver that to you in a contactless way if you are at home and you are isolating. Dr Bloomfield. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So today I can report there are 21 new positive cases of COVID-19 in the community, taking the total number of confirmed cases in the current Auckland community outbreak to 72. All cases have been or are being safely transferred to one of our quarantine facilities. 
Of the 21 new cases, 20 are in Auckland, one is here in Wellington, and that Wellington case was actually first reported yesterday, but has just been included in the national tally today, so there remain a total of six cases in Wellington. 61 of the cases are now confirmed as part of the Auckland uh, cluster, with the remaining 11 under investigation to confirm a linkage to the outbreak, either epidemiologically or through whole genome sequencing or both, but initial assessment in most cases show an obvious link. Public health staff are obviously rapidly interviewing the new cases to establish how they were infected and any further details of their movements and possible locations of interest. That information will be released as it becomes available. In addition to the community cases, there are three cases to report in managed isolation today. ESR continues to run the whole genome sequencing daily on samples uh, taken from all new cases to support our ongoing investigation. Reporting today on 17 of the cases shows that all have genomic links to the Auckland cluster, and that includes the University of Auckland student who travelled to Wellington uh, late last week. As the genomes, genome sequences are all largely identical, there is no additional information as yet from the genome sequencing as to the direction of infection between cases. On contact tracing, the number of contacts has increased significantly, something we had expected as we identify more cases and locations of interest. As of nine o'clock this morning, 8,667 individual contacts had been formally identified, and we expect that will continue to increase through the day as further records are fully processed. Virtually all of those contacts are considered close contacts, so are receiving regular follow-up. Of them, 4,124 have already been formally followed up and are self-isolating, and a third have already returned a test. Work is underway to contact, contact the remaining 4,500 or so contacts, and most of these were identified yesterday as a result of recent high exposure large events. From today, contacts who are self-isolating can choose to send their daily health and wellbeing information via an electronic survey, that is email, rather than phone call daily. Uh, these people are all initially contacted by phone, and if they opt to go for um, uh, email welfare checks, then they can do so, which helps free up capacity in our contact tracing teams and further speed up the process. On locations of interest, from today, new locations of interest will be published every two hours. Uh, if there is a significant or urgent location of interest, that will be published uh, immediately. There are already uh, more than 280 locations of interest identified across the Motu. And we have also launched a new online search feature to make it easier for people to check for locations of interest. That is alongside the map as well. Uh, there was a small glitch in the system earlier today when the table was updated. Uh, the last updated date reset to today's date, and that is uh, now being corrected. And from here, the last updated date will continue to uh, update on a daily basis, but it won't change unless there is new information. Uh, as well as moving to the automated system, some locations of interest that were previously removed uh, that were dated from prior to the 7th of August were republished this morning, but those have now been taken down again and those are no longer of concern. Now, several of the new cases announced to date are linked to a church service at the Samoan Assembly of God Church in Mangere in Auckland last Sunday, the 15th of August. So anyone at this church between 9am and 3pm last Sunday, the 15th of August, if you haven't already, you are asked to isolate for 14 days since that exposure on Sunday and be tested immediately or on days 5 and 12. The best thing to do is to call Healthline on 0800 358 5453 for advice on testing and they have uh, interpreters there if required uh, for a range of languages. For all other New Zealanders, our advice of course remains the same if you are symptomatic or have been at one of the lo those locations of interest that newly emerges, please self-isolate in your bubble and call Healthline for advice on testing. Uh, on testing, I would like to just reiterate that advice. If you are not a contact or you're not symptomatic, then you don't need to uh, be tested. The most important thing you can do to contribute to our 
overall response is to stay home. That's your best protection. Yesterday, 38,389 tests were processed across the country. So in the last week, more than 127,000 tests have been processed, equivalent to almost 3% of the New Zealand population. Clearly a huge effort and helps to build the picture of the outbreak and give us increasing confidence about where the boundaries of it are. Testing centres in Auckland were busy again yesterday with more than 20,000 swabs taken across Tamaki Makoto, around 9,000 in community testing centres and around 11,000 in general practice and urgent care clinics. I can only say thank you once again to all the staff there. There are 15 community centres across Auckland today and an additional centre is being stood up at the Pukekohe showgrounds, open from 2 to 6pm today and 8.30 to 5pm tomorrow. There's also continuing uh, community testing in Coromandel, Thames and Hamilton, and there is a centre as well in Tokoroa, given the exposure there uh, that, uh, at a location of interest. Uh, all DHBs continue to provide good uh, access to testing across the region, and there are good numbers of tests across the country. There is some un uh, unprecedented demand for testing, as you can see by those numbers, so there may be some delays in getting the results through. However, I can say that the labs are working through the backlog very quickly. Uh, for testing locations nationwide, visit the HealthPoint website. That's healthpoint.co.nz. On wastewater testing, ESR is now testing at 41 sites around the country. That covers 3.7 million New Zealanders. 13 of these sites are in Auckland, in Fora and Wellington, and further sites are also being added. Uh, there were detections reported in both Auckland and Wellington today. Uh, in Co Wellington, it was again a sample from Moa Point, uh, which was taken yesterday. But samples from other sites in Wellington, at Porirua, Seaview and Karori, are all negative. Wastewater testing in Auckland was from samples taken on Friday. Uh, and these were positive in the eastern and western catchments of the city. But the most recent test for the North Shore from both Rosedale and Albany was negative for the first time this week. Test results from the latest sampling in Walkworth are expected in the next couple of days. And otherwise, there have been no other positive detections in our wastewater testing right across the Motu. On PPE stocks, I would like to confirm we have excellent PPE stocks to respond and support this current outbreak response. These supplies are available to all providers, including primary care. We had been working very closely with primary care to make available fit testing for N95 masks, including providing fit testing machines out to primary care. Uh, given that, that not all primary care providers had been able to do that, we are still making N95 masks available in this situation. We have a good system for people to be able to order the PPE they need, and that includes in aged residential care, and the feedback we are getting is that there are no problems there. Our national PPE supply chain currently holds, in country, not en route or elsewhere, 18 million N95 uh, masks, 285 million medical masks, 18 million isolation gowns, 1.6 million face shields, and 280 million nitrile gloves. There are also good volumes of hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, and other items that are used. Under alert level four, all health providers can order the PPE they need as and when. An update on our, the situation in our hospitals. North Shore Hospitals Emergency Department opened again at 4 p.m. yesterday for adults. In the meantime, Paediatric uh, Children's Emergency Department is being diverted to Waitakere Hospital, which is the DHB's primary uh, child healthcare site until further notice. As at 7.30 this morning, 1,191 Waitamata DHB staff had undergone testing. Uh, both on-site and at community centres, and all returned results are negative, with just 19 results still pending. There were 171 staff who were potentially in contact with the, the positive patient at North Shore Hospital earlier in the week, and 109 of those have returned negative swabs so far. Overall health system capacity is good across the Motu. Hospital occupancy is around 74% on average, ranging from 52% to 89%, while intensive care unit occupancy is just over 50% presently. It is very important that anybody who needs care for any reason seeks it. Do not delay. 
all health services, including ambulance services, primary care and hospitals are operating safely under Alert Level 4 protocols. Uh, on the vaccination program, uh, th there was a change to the program today such that the minimum wait time after a vaccination is now 15 minutes instead of 20 minutes. This is based on advice from our, uh, our COVID vaccination technical advisory group and is consistent with the approach in a number of other countries, including Australia and the United States. I myself was one of the first person, uh, people to uh, have the benefit of that slightly shorter waiting time this morning. Uh, it is the standard wait time, as I said, actually in both the UK and the US. Finally, on a separate note, uh, as the Minister said, and I want to reiterate this, some people are going for their COVID vaccination or, uh, after or while a uh, test, or while on the way home, or while waiting for a test result. Please don't. Please don't visit the pharmacy or uh, the supermarket or the petrol station. It's very important and the most important thing people can do if they ha uh, need a test or have had a test that they isolate until they receive the test result. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. We're all getting used to wearing our masks when we're out of the house for essential travel or for uh, doing our shopping. I appreciate it's not what we're used to, but we are all getting used to uh, having our masks. I'd like to remind everyone it is mandatory to wear them when visiting Alert Level 4 businesses and services. Ministers have also decided, based on advice that we've received and we've been working through over the last few weeks, that record keeping, such as scanning with the COVID-19 Tracer app, or manually signing in will become mandatory for most events and businesses at all alert levels. It's clear that when people use the app or manually sign in rather than relying on their memory, contact tracing can happen much more quickly. And as we know, particularly in light of uh, the situation we're facing with the Delta variant, speed means a lot. So we know from our own and from overseas examples that an outbreak of COVID-19 uh, can be extremely difficult to trace and contain without people having a good record of where they have been and who they've come into contact with. So it will become mandatory to make a record of where you have been uh, and the sorts of places where people gather consistently and in large numbers. That includes cafes, restaurants, bars, casinos, concerts, aged care facilities, healthcare facilities, barbers, exercise facilities, nightclubs, libraries, courts, local and central government agencies and social service providers uh, who have a customer service counter. Places where records are already kept and people are already required to sign in, like gyms and some workplaces, won't need to adjust what they are already doing because they are already complying. Mandatory record keeping is requ already required at social gatherings when visiting a marae, at, at a wedding, a funeral, a tangihana, or a faith-based service when we are at alert level two. We're now making that a requirement at all alert levels. The obligation will be on the person responsible for the place or the gathering to ensure that people scan or sign in. This will become effective seven days after any change in alert level settings that might allow more businesses to open or gatherings to go ahead, to give people time to get their systems in place. We want to ensure that businesses and those who might be organising a gathering event have the time to get this sorted. It is an additional responsibility that we're placing on them, but we ask them to do that as quickly as they possibly can. In terms of support for essential workers, uh, people will recall that under Alert Level 4 last year, we made sure that childcare ar arrangements were available for essential workers who did not have other arrangements that would allow them to go to work. The government's agreed to put that scheme back in place under Alert Level 4. That will support people such as emergency service workers, border workers, uh, and others who have to go to work at Alert Level 4 uh, to provide quality care for their children. The Ministry of Education is working with 32 different providers across the country, uh, and they are being made available for parents to contact from today. Just like last time, these are all licensed services that usually provide home-based early childhood education, so all of the necessary safety checks are in place. Each carer involved in the scheme will be limited to providing care for only one family. So there is limited capacity, but that means that the bubbles will stay t tight and we can ensure that uh, this doesn't become a way for the virus to spread. Families that already have in-home childcare arrangements in place won't be eligible. These arra those arrangements can continue as long as the carer is only dealing with one family. 
The government has also agreed to put in place an uh, emergency payment scheme for relief teachers and casual support staff, uh, and that what these people are not available, uh, eligible for the wage subsidy. Further information on that will be released by the Ministry of Education. I know people are also keen to know what's happening with schooling and what preparations are underway in the event that some of our young people need to continue to learn from home. We are in the process of purchasing additional devices uh, and making sure that we have additional hard packs of materials available to send out should we need those. We already have 36,000 devices out in schools in Kura across the country, supporting uh, Year 9 to 13 students to learn from home, and we're supporting 40,000 households to stay connected to the internet where they wouldn't otherwise be able to. Online resources for teachers, parents and students are available for on learningfromhome.govt.nz and the Kita Marama websites, they're available in both English and in Māori. The on-demand content from the home learning and um, Māori Reo, Māori TV stations that were set up during the last lockdown continue to be available to TVNZ On Demand. If we do need to extend uh, the use of those services, we will be able to stand up those learning from home TV channels again and add new contact if that's necessary. I want to finish by reiterating what the Prime Minister said yesterday. Remember to look out for your friends, neighbours and your family. Do they need supplies? Are they lonely? Drop them a text, give them a call, uh, do check up on them. Uh, hearing a familiar voice or just listening can help people to feel connected and cared for. It's a small but important thing that we can all do. Please stay in your bubble. You just need to look across to our friends in Australia to see how people flouting the rules uh, can drive ongoing transmission within the community. That would keep extending lockdown further, as it has done in Australia. If we all stay in our bubbles, if we all resist the urge to travel unless it's essential, however tempting uh, it might be, then we can uh, help to get, we can all contribute to getting through this. The vast majority of New Zealanders are doing the right thing. I want to extend a very warm thank you to all of you for that. The last thing that we want to see is post-lockdown transmission, so keep it local, wear a mask and keep your distance. When buying your groceries, wear a mask and sign in using the app or the book. And the next press, also just a final reminder, the next press conference will be at three o'clock tomorrow after Cabinet has made decisions uh, on alert levels. Jessica. But how long should people expect to stay at level four lockdown for? Uh, look, there's still a whole 24 hours worth of information together, and we do make those. To, you know, we do get the latest information together right before the cabinet meeting, so that we can make that based on the latest data. Um, and I've always, I think we've always indicated before, regional boundaries are a possibility, so that some, not everyone will stay at the same alert level right the way through. As we get a better handle on risk, and we will know even more in 24 hours than we know now there will be this potential for movement. Now, that movement may not happen immediately, but we may be able to signal it. I'm not, I don't want to foreshadow any decisions we might make tomorrow because, as I've said, we've still got 24 hours' worth of information together. The South Island is an obvious one. Would you consider uh, siphoning off some of the areas in the North Island as well? Obviously, um, you know, Wellington and Auckland have been the main hotspots, but is there a possibility that some regions in the North Island could also be separated. What I can tell you is that our planners uh, for some time now have worked up a whole variety of different scenarios for different uh, challenges up and down the country and that includes a variety of different regional boundaries that could be applied whether it's a regional boundary for Auckland, a regional boundary for Auckland and the Coromandel and the Bay of Plenty and, and Waikato, a regional boundary for Wellington. These are all possibilities that are on the table uh, but what I would say is we will give people plenty of notice at such time as, as we are you know, uh, looking to move if we were to do that. Um, I don't want to, I don't, I really don't want to preempt what we might end up with tomorrow because there's still more information together. I'll let you finish that just um, With that uh, so Samoan Assembly of God um, church service that you highlighted, how concerned should we be about that? Is there a possibility it could be a super spreader event? How many cases are linked to that service? I'll let Dr Bloomfield comment on that. One thing that I would just uh, note about this particular group of cases that we are dealing with is uh, we are seeing more large events and more large gatherings in this than in any of the outbreaks that we've dealt with before. And so that is meaning we've got many more contacts than we have before. Uh, that, of course, does put the system under pressure. Thanks, Minister. I just want to reiterate that point that actually it's one of a number of large gatherings and we've got several schools, uh, large schools also involved. 
Um, so this is a priority for our contact tracing efforts. And what we have seen in the past, of course, the Pacific community leaders are very good at mobilising the community to get tested. And this is coming through in our, uh, our testing results. So by far the highest rate of testing is amongst our Pacific community. And we want to encourage that because uh, by getting tested, we will, will identify any cases. But certainly there is uh, a number of cases now around that event, including three of our cases down here in Wellington who had been at that event in Auckland. Well, in fact, um, the church service, there's the schools. What are the other big events uh, that, you th that need to be highlighted and prioritised like you talked about? So a couple that come to mind. One is that our University of Auckland student who is now in Wellington had attended, uh, was, was a, uh, at a university hall and attended a common dining area and also attended a, a large ball with others uh, on the Saturday night. Uh, that's, those are certainly big events. But really any of these uh, large places like the bars and so on are of course a, a high priority for contact tracing. We'll come to media and then Derek. Thank you. Um, on the mandatory QR code scanning, did you have to expedite this decision because you were finding that so few people who you needed to contact weren't using the app? Uh, unfortunately, it's actually the opposite. We were due to announce this last Wednesday. Of course, that was our first day of lockdown, so there was not much point in announcing it last Wednesday when everyone had to stay home anyway. Uh, but we're announcing it now so that people know that that's what they should expect when the lockdown uh, is over, whenever that may be. But so... Um, we got figures back from the Ministry of Health last night that 32% of the um, outbreak, uh, the contacts needed to be contacted from this outbreak were using that app. Is that good enough and is this why you've had to... Uh, look, you will have heard me say for some time I've been dissatisfied with the amount of QR code scanning that's been going on. We've been exploring how to best do this, and that's included consideration of the privacy aspects of that, also consideration of uh, some of the rules around the Bluetooth uh, framework that we are using and making sure we don't lose access to that. Um, you'll note that we're talking about mandatory record keeping rather than mandatory use of the QR code system. Uh, we want people to be keeping a record. I would highly recommend to them the QR code system because it's a very fast, safe, uh, easy, convenient way to keep a record of where you've been. And will there be any sort of more support for businesses who are now going to have to enforce this? Um, look, we want to give businesses a bit of time to adjust, and some of them will need a little bit of time after we come out of our alert level four to make any adjustments that they need. So we're giving them, we will give them a little bit of a grace period uh, in order to do that. Um, we do acknowledge that it is an extra impost on business, but a lot less than higher alert levels. So this is something uh, we've, we've been consulting and speaking widely with the business community, the hospitality sector. They are actually very supportive of this move because they can see the benefit of it in terms of reducing the probability um, of having to be closed for long periods of time. Uh, sorry, can I just clarify Dr. Luke, I'm just following on from GS, you said three of the cases in Wellington went to the church service on Sunday. Can you tell us how many of the cases in the cluster in total are from that church service so far? No, I don't have the total number of that, and some of the new cases uh, are still being interviewed that may or may not be associated with that. Do you with that service. people were at the service or No, I don't. And do you also know if there are any cases you, 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 uh, said you just focused on the University of Auckland students, the common dining area and the large ball, have there any, been any cases come from those venues? My understanding from the discussion this morning, uh, amongst the uh, 11 cases that are as yet not formally linked, a couple of those are University of Auckland students, so we'd anticipate that link there, but we'll update as, as soon as we've got more information does it, on that. Does it seem that so far, then, of the 72 cases, most of them are from like household transmission rather than locations of interest transmission at this point? Well, as we saw even last August, there, there sort of are these clusters emerging, and one is around the Samoan Assembly of God. Um, there's certainly one around uh, the, the, the initial cases were all clustered around a flat and acquaintances, partners, workmates around that. Um, and this is what we do see. And again, uh, as you're suggesting, like New South Wales, we are seeing quite high transmission inside households of this variant. No other locations at the stage to be uh, concerned about as a potential Not specific locations of interest. Thank you. Can I ask you, in previous lockdowns we've had breakdowns in the health status of each person, as in how many might be hospitalised for requiring ICU level care. Can, can, do you have those figures, this proportion now? Uh, at the moment, my understanding is we still have two people in hospital. We've not had anyone who's required uh, hosp um, ICU level care. Um, actually, let me give you an update here. Sorry, we have five people, or uh, none of whom are in ICU.
And do, Ms. Hipkins, do you have an update on the um, source investigation and how um, the virus might have leaked from MIQ Festival at the period? Oh, I can say that the source investigation remains an investigation. Um, so we are running down every lead that we possibly can. We haven't got a confirmed um, hypothesis at this point. Um, I'll invite the Director General to, to make a comment as well as if he wants to. Thanks, Sarah. Minister. Uh, one comment just to start with is that the four cases from the Crown Plaza are all included in this outbreak amongst the numbers, so they're considered as part of the outbreak. You remember we are uh, focusing on the most likely source is the person who had come back from New South Wales and was in the Crown Plaza. We still haven't yet uh, exposed exactly where that ex um, the virus may have got from that person into the community, but that person also, uh, or there was infection also of three people in the neighbouring room. So those four people are considered part of the cluster. We continue to pursue every avenue uh, quite vigorously to see where that transmission might have occurred. Have you test results from the 408 odd people at the Jet Park and the Crown Plaza, the workers? Have you had those tests? Uh, actually, I think those were all back a couple of days ago. Um, if they hadn't been tested in the preceding 48 hours, they were all retested and all those results negative. The, the feedback that we've had so far is that uh, start, you know, uh, a transmission to staff and then staff bringing it into the community at this point is almost ruled out as a, as a possibility. We'll come up to the back, Jo. Uh, just in terms of the investigation, Dr Bloomfield, the three who contracted from the original case, uh, did you see walkway area on the 12th of August for about 16 minutes. I know there were no other returnees there, but what has the CCTV footage shown up in terms of that public walkway right next to it that shares the same airspace? Yeah, my understanding is, the Minister will correct me, is that there were that, that, that showed three people who had used that public walkway who possibly were there at the point in time when this person who we think is the source of the outbreak was being moved into the hotel. Uh, the team is working with the police to identify and follow up each of those people just to see if they may be part of the existing uh, outbreak. So that's an active line that you are yes. looking at at the moment. Yes. Can I also just ask too, in terms of the um, health advice around using a vehicle for exercise, there seems to be some confusion in terms of the police and how they're pursuing it versus the health order. Can you just clarify that for people please? I'm very happy to comment on that. People can exercise uh, if they can't. You can get in their car to drive to somewhere to exercise if they can't exercise, you know, right beside their home within walking distance. But it should, they shouldn't be travelling miles to go to the beach or to uh, somewhere that's a long way away. Um, so if you're living on a hill, for example, and you have children and you need to take them somewhere flat, you can use your car for that. If you're elderly and you need to go somewhere flat, you can use your car for that. If you're in a high density area and it's not safe to exercise around where you are, you can use your car to get to somewhere where you can uh, you can exercise in a way that's socially distanced from others. But we don't want people travelling across town. So it should be to a relatively, to the nearest place that you can go. In terms of what you saw then, there was obviously time lapses and things that came up yesterday, a beautiful day in the capital. I mean, are you happy with the amount of activity and what you're seeing at places like the waterfront and, and the same for Auckland as well? Look, it is a challenge in higher density areas for people to get outside and to uh, spread their legs when they are... Um, uh, when they're, when they're surrounded by other people. And so in some cases, it might be more sensible for them to drive a short distance to get to somewhere where they can be further away from other people. Key things, wear a mask when you're, you know, if, if you just can't get away from being around other people, maintain your distancing as much as you possibly can. Uh, and if it isn't safe to do that, like if you can't keep away from other people, then think about whether or not you really, really need to do that. Well, you know, are you aware of any MPs or ministers who have been identified as close contacts? given there are a large number of close contacts now? Uh, no, not so far. Um, I'm aware that you know p p people ask questions, uh, I think it was yesterday, about the University of Auckland, where the Prime Minister, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and myself were there on Tuesday. Um, I can confirm we were visiting a construction site there. Uh, none of the case investigation has uh, indicated any uh, potential risk of any, uh, any contact at that point. Can I just can I please further to Joe's question? There are lots of people out and about that aren't wearing masks. Why not just make mask use mandatory when you step outside your home, given the high transmissibility of Delta? When people are exercising, going for a run, for example, I acknowledge that wearing a mask is not necessarily a practical option. So they should be doing that where they can be well distanced from other people. Um, and uh, by and large, we're seeing good compliance with that. 
Yeah. We'll come down the front here. When it comes to record keeping, can you just clarify what the maximum penalty will be and what the enforcement will look like for, for businesses? So it will be a penalty in line with what we currently have under the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act, which varies from $300 to $1,000, depending on the circumstances. Um, I want to foreshadow at this point we are reviewing the penalties. Uh, they were, any, any change to that would require legislation through Parliament, which clearly we can't do right at the moment. Um, but at the moment, it would be consistent with, the, with what's allowed for in the Act. And but I said, for, for enforcement, are you worried for that businesses will be the time to patrons that are perhaps frustrated with, with the rules or...? Um, look, I acknowledge that um, we are asking more of businesses here, um, but I think the feedback we've had from them is that they are eager to get some clarity around this. They know what a benefit it is, um, and they also know that it will help to avoid them having to stay closed for longer. So we're getting good feedback there. My message to, uh, to everybody is where businesses are enforcing a legal requirement, um, don't take that out on the businesses if you're dissatisfied with that. Um, make sure you are complying. It is ultimately a legal requirement and the businesses are just doing what they should be doing. Can Look, I please... um, how are vaccine stocks, uh, particularly given the, the ramp up the last few days, how are vaccine stocks, when's the next lot arrive, is there any chance that we're going to get close to zero? So we're getting weekly deliveries in. We've got about seven, uh, our, our weekly Delivery arrived yesterday uh, for, for next week, so it arrived a little bit early. That's good. We've got about 750,000 uh, in the freezer at the moment, either in the freezer or in, the, in, in distribution at the moment. So that means that at our current rates of around you know 50,000 plus a day, if we can continue at that rate, there's no risk of us running out before the next shipment arrives, which will be uh, within the next... Uh, probably within the next 10 days. They have actually been arriving a little ahead of schedule. They normally arrive on a Monday or a Tuesday. They arrived yesterday. How and, uh, are the shipments now? Uh, the shipments are generally over 350,000 doses. So at a 50,000 uh, dose a day rate, um, we're getting enough in to replenish our stocks each week. And we have actually got a bit of a buffer there, as you can see. Well, can I just clarify? Now we'll come... Can I but, but, yeah. In Sydney, they've been reporting the number of people who have been out in the community while infectious. Is that something you'd consider doing here? Uh, I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. It's something we might move to start doing at the moment. Uh, the expression of that is, of course, the locations of interest. Uh, many of those will predate the uh, start of the lockdown, but certainly as we move into a period where we would expect uh, the number of locations of inter interest to drop, we will look at reporting whether any of those new cases have been out and about in the community other than for just trips to the supermarket or the pharmacy, or for example, if they're essential workers and may have been at work. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of well, the cluster, do you, do you know how many people who are contacts of cases have, have been essential workers and might have been out and about? Uh, no, not at this point, but what I would say is our teams are absolutely prioritising any of the contacts who could, who are essential workers, so that's where the priority goes first, to get them at home isolating. Okay, Just after that. Considering how easily transmissible this is within our home, how many people have taken up the opportunity to go into a managed isolation facility because they can't self-isolate away from their, um, their household? Um, do you have the figures on that? And how are you making sure that people who are self-isolating in their homes how do you make sure that they are keeping that distance and doing the best they can? Look, I don't have the latest numbers uh, on people who have taken that. Uh, from this morning's report, just a few. Yeah. But that option is open there, so there are a few people, less than 10, who have taken up that option of going into a managed isolation facility. In terms of inside the house, we really do rely on people to keep their other whānau members safe. Uh, and, of course, they get advice around how to do that. There's some quite good guidance around how to make sure you are self-isolating safely within your bubble. Sorry, if, I could be, if I could provide some clarity too, there are, there, there are, we have dedicated quarantine for those who are, have tested positive for COVID-19. We have around 270 rooms available for that. Only about 70 of them are occupied at the moment. So we have plenty of capacity for positive cases to be isolated uh, through our quarantine facilities. We've repurposed one of our uh, MIQ facilities for domestic uh, isolation purposes, so not people coming into the country, but people who need to isolate because they can't safely isolate at home. That will accommodate, uh, that's got at least, uh, I think it's about 250 rooms that are available should we need those. So there are rooms available for people should they need to be isolating. Actually, on just sort of on this point, um, can you please just clarify specifically what the rules are for a close contact who is self-isolating in a house with others? 
I might ask the Director General to run through that. Well, well anyone who's self-isolating should self-isolate within their bubble. In other words, not uh, put other people in their, in their household at, at potential risk. So this is one of the ways also that um, uh, we can avoid potential um, spread within households, particularly until they have returned that negative day five test. So that's been just staying in their bedrooms, essentially, and the rest of the household going about business, or the entire household needs to essentially self-isolate and not leave until it, that person gets their test back? It's the former. However, uh, we, we are asking, yes, people who are household contacts of someone who is a close contact. So two things. Within the household, the, clo the close contact should be isolating separate from other household members. Those household members need to stay isolated, which means not going out to the supermarket or for a vaccination or to the pharmacy until the initial person has returned a day five negative test. Minister, um, is mountain biking an appropriate activity during level four? Uh, look, we would encourage people not to engage in things that are high risk. So if people are um, biking away from home, uh, it's, it's nearby, it's safe, and there's not any risk of them you know, being injured and therefore requiring assistance. A bike ride can be a legitimate form of exercise. Um, but I'm, I'm very mindful of the controversy around this, so I'd, en I'd encourage everyone just to be cautious, stay close to home, don't do anything that's risky that might then result in you needing to get assistance. Can I ask you a question also about um, vaccination rates in prisons too? Um, we understand that there was a pause, um, that the prison population was was told to pause their vaccination rate. Is that appropriate given how close, close together um, prisons op operate and could be quite a, vul a vulnerable area for us? Oh, we're very mindful of the people who we have in custody. Um, and the potential for COVID-19 to spread uh, significantly and quickly in those kind of settings. We've seen that elsewhere around the world. Uh, it is one of the reasons why we have had a vaccination program in our prisons. I don't have the latest numbers uh, with me, but I'm certainly happy to get those for you. To pause then. Uh, look, I, I will have to come back to you on that. I don't have that information with me at the moment, but I can certainly get it for you. Can you uh, just go back to the domestic isolation facility? Is that one in Wellington or is that in addition to the Jet Park? Auckland. That's in Auckland. Um, uh, there's the Holiday Inn in Auckland near, near the airport, which we'll be using there. Um, our, facility in, our facilities in Wellington and Christchurch also have capacity as well. They'll be in dual-use facilities, though, where we separate out different wings of the facilities for, for different groups. And can I just have a bit of clarification, just for people who have their uh, second COVID vaccine, uh, booked in three weeks later uh, with the new guidance, should they be changing that? Or should, as we're in the middle of a pandemic, should they be keeping that booking? No, no, they don't have to. So people who were already booked when we extended the time frame from three weeks to six weeks, they can continue to get their second dose at uh, at six weeks if that's what they wish to do. They are, of course, welcome um, to rebook for six weeks later, six weeks after their first dose, if that's what they want to do. But they don't have to rebook. The difference around the, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine between those two timeframes? Look, when we made the decision, the advice that we had overall was that uh, a six-week gap rather than a three-week gap resulted in as good, if not slightly better, uh, effectiveness of the vaccine. So uh, it really is up to those people to make a call as to whether they want to shift their timing. They don't have to. Um, we'll the front here. Yes, so the normal process is they get daily health checks uh, and we have uh, staff across all our public health units now, they're at their 100% of their surge capacity. Uh, the health line, Whakarangaro, also does a lot of those outbound follow-up calls and we have other uh, providers that do that too. But in addition, as I said earlier on, the we are moving those people who are happy to, to have that check done just by filling in an email survey and sending that in each day. And so, just have a couple of questions from Mark. Um, has Apple and Google said this approach is okay in terms of the mandatory scanning and um, whether they'd pull their support for Bluetooth, Bluetooth tracing? Because they've previously indicated that they would if it became mandatory. And will you consider legislation prohibiting that scanning and sign and data being, from being used for anything other than contact tracing? The advice that we've had is that Apple and Google um, are okay with a mandatory record keeping requirement, um, but wouldn't be comfortable with a mandatory use of the COVID tracer app requirement. 
Um, and uh, while most people will use the COVID Tracer app as their way of keeping their record, um, we're not making that a requirement. We are making it a requirement for people to keep a record. So some, and actually some of our community do already pen and paper. They, they keep a, a written record of where they have been, um, and that is perfectly acceptable for them to do. Uh, in terms of um, the legislative change around whether we would uh, prevent that information being used for other purposes, we haven't considered a legislative change at this point. Uh, we have been clear that we would not envisage it being used for any other purpose than contact tracing. That is the purpose for which it is collected. We would not envisage it being used for any other purpose. Similarly, when we collect information for testing and for vaccines, we do not use that for any other law enforcement purposes. We use it only for the purpose uh, that we collect it for. This is really important because where we have people, for example, if they're an overstayer, um, we need them to come forward and be tested. Uh, and we don't want them to not come forward and be tested if they think that it might mean that they'll be in trouble with immigration. So we're very clear where we're collecting information for, con for COVID-19 purposes. That is the only purpose that we will use that information for. It is really important that we get everybody sharing the information we need them to share um, to make sure that our response is as robust and strong as it, as it can be. I'll let you just have that one last question and then, and then I will do a sweep of the quick sweep of the room. Um, just on your comments this morning about um, it never been presented to us as an option to get Pfizer earlier, um, does that suggest that that was not something that the government pushed for themselves, it was just that Pfizer never actually offered that as, um, you know, put it out before you should? Look, we, were in regular we have been in regular conversation with Pfizer since uh, February or January when we made the decision to, to go all in with that, um, to see uh, whether there's anything that we can do to get bigger deliveries faster. So that's been an ongoing conversation. Ultimately, um, we've, mo we've moved as quickly as possible. Um, we've, we've used every lever that we've had available to us. The Prime Minister has spoken directly with the Chief Executive of Pfizer on several occasions to see if we can speed up our deliveries. There's been a lot of uh, effort that's gone into that. Ultimately, we're dealing with a vaccine that's in high demand. It is one of the most popular vaccines around the world, for good reason. Um, and they are, of course, working very, very hard to try and meet that demand. Pfizer have been very upfront with us um, about what they'll deliver and when they'll deliver it. They've generally exceeded the expectations that they've set. So if they've told us they're going to deliver a certain amount of vaccines, they've generally over-delivered on that. Um, so they've been very good to work with in that regard. They've not committed to anything that they haven't been able to deliver on. Maybe Come question here. for Dr Bloomfield. Do we know the number of contact tracers that are working at the moment? And can you speak to the challenges in dealing with huge numbers of close contacts that would have otherwise been considered casual contacts in a pre-Delta era? So just on the second point there, yes, this is uh, something that has meant we've had to stand up the wider system right up to full capacity. And uh, that on top of uh, the, um, the, the, the large volumes of testing and the fact that we're also um, doing the immunisation at the same time has meant it's put a lot of pressure on the system. But this is, we had prepared for this. I don't have the numbers uh, exactly of contact traces, but we can break, get that uh, as a breakdown, including those working in our public health units and those working in the call centres like Whakarangaro. All right, one last rapid-fire round. You get one last question each, and we'll start over there. Um, there's some research from Oxford University last week published uh, regarding the efficacy, the ongoing efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine shows it becomes less effective four or five months after the second dose. Are you concerned that when you do order booster shots, that four or five month period will have already elapsed for our frontline border workers who will be operating at the frontline with a lower e efficacy? So we already have additional shots available should we need to use them for uh, for booster shots. So we've got 10 mil over 10 million doses of the vaccine coming between now and the end of the year. Um, we know that we'll need about 8.2 million of those uh, doses to fully deliver to the eligible population if everybody comes forward to get one. So we will have additional doses available. And of course, we're in conversations to, uh, to make sure that we have supply available next year of vaccines. Uh, supply is available next year and that uh, includes canvassing all of the different options and looking at uh, what our needs will be. And we'd make that decision, as we always have, uh, based on the uh, best health and science advice available to us. So you're implying that when you get that the That wasn't quite advice, a rapid-fire question. But, but. But just as a follow-up, like as a, as a, um, so you're implying that when you, when you get the clinical advice about when the best interval for that booster shot is, those border workers will get their booster shot from that supply, likely. 
if that is what the advice um, from health is, then we, we have doses available should we need to use them. You're taking cash away from the team. Yep. When will the decision be made about Parliament sitting this week, and is Parliament sitting an essential service? Uh, we'll make a decision about that after Cabinet on Monday. We'll have conversations with the other political parties before we make that decision. Um, and, and part of those conversations, of course, will include uh, how we ensure democratic scrutiny uh, in the event that Parliament is unable to meet in person as it normally would, and that will include uh, consideration of select committee meetings, televising select committee meetings, and a whole variety of other things. So conversations have already started, um, and we'll continue to have that, but we need a final decision about how long we're doing this for or whether we're doing this for, for the next week or two before we can uh, finalise that. Do you think look, it's an essential service? Do you think Parliament sitting is an essential service? Uh, look, Parliament is vitally important. There's no question about that. Um, Parliament regularly doesn't sit for several weeks at a time, um, and, uh, you know, we will ultimately make decisions next week. Um, is there enough support available to people who are self-isolating at home and maybe uh, quite isolated? I mean, have reports that it might take up to six days to get some groceries delivered, or even some supermarkets you can't even get click or collect or delivery now because they're just totally snowballed. I mean, is there enough support? And what can people do to, say, get groceries? Look, I know that the supermarkets are working really hard to support people to get groceries, for example, with, the, with home deliveries and so on. Um, please, when ordering through the supermarkets, let them know if, if, you, know, if, if you need it um, and that you have no other option but, the, but their home deliveries. Please let them know that um, so that they can prioritise if at all possible. Um, I know the supermarkets are working really hard to try and do that. Again, uh, this is a, a, a situation where neighbours can help. They can do grocery shopping for their neighbours and contactless deliver them um, to their neighbours. And I've seen examples of where that's happening around the country, and I just commend people for taking that approach. Amy, um, yeah. look, some, doc some doctors who haven't been briefed first prior to announcements are getting flooded with calls and questions, um, such as uh, the 12-year-old who were coming in for vaccines. What's your advice? For them, is, was, is that more of a DHB issue? And also, are you happy with service stations selling takeaway coffee under alert level four? Uh, so look, if you're bringing uh, your younger family members with you to be vaccinated, make sure you've made an appointment for them as well. Uh, if people are being turned away bringing their, their children with them to be vaccinated, it'll be because the, cent the place that they're going doesn't have the capacity to be able to vaccinate that many people. So ring your head and make sure that, you, that they have the capacity to be able to do that. Where they don't, uh, we have got systems in place so that those people would be able to rebook within two weeks uh, to get their vaccines at the same time as their children. Children. So the key message is ring ahead. Uh, in terms of coffee, uh, service stations are a level four essential service. Uh, Dr. Blumper, do you have the latest metric on the contact tracing metric for reaching 80% of contacts within 48 hours? No, we, we don't as yet, and uh, we will be working on that. However, as we were discussing yesterday with uh, the Prime Minister and Ministers, those metrics were established at a time when we had very small numbers of close contacts and more likely to have casual contacts. As part of our planning for a Delta outbreak, we had uh, taken a much broader approach to uh, identifying people as close contacts, and so there's a huge number of them in this situation. But we will endeavour to start publishing those metrics uh, as we collect enough, you know, as we get further into the outbreak. I just wanted to ask, Minister, if you've had any confirmation of September deliveries. Uh, no, not at this point. Yeah. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. No. As mentioned at the beginning, uh, both of you pointed out about the um, not going to the dairy or the supermarket on your way home from getting a test. How many times has that happened? Why did you need to highlight that? Uh, look, we, we get anecdotal reports of that, of course, um, and so uh, we don't we can't quantify that. Uh, but it is certainly something that we don't want people to be doing. Ultimately, if you're getting a test, it means that there's a reason for that, and you're more at risk. And therefore, until that risk has been um, eliminated, or if you like, if, you, if you've had confirmation that you, you're not at risk because you've got a negative test result then really we want you going straight to the testing station and straight home again and avoiding coming into contact with anybody or going anywhere that you don't need to be. Um, aged, thank you. Aged care facilities um, are having to close hospital level beds and have huge staff shortages because nurses are leaving for district health boards and to become COVID vaccinators. What is your message to them? And then separately, 
Um, in other countries, people are being vaccinated as they go to get tested. Is there are there any plans for that? Perhaps when the rollout reaches the whole population to do two in one. In answer to the second part of the question, no, not at this point, because we are um, vaccinating asymptomatic people, uh, and there's good health reasons not to uh, vaccinate people who are who are symptomatic for w whatever reason. Um, in terms of the first one, I just simply say to all of our frontline health workers, thank you. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, you're under an enormous amount of pressure, um, and it, I think our health system is responding remarkably well, and I think we should all be really grateful to the work that they are putting in. Just on vaccinations, has there been a vaccination plan specifically designed for the homeless community? Um, what's the uptake been like and um, how's that going? Actually, I can comment on that because it's come up. Um, just w when I was having my vaccination this morning, the team were telling me about a very speci specific initiative initiative they did here in Wellington um, with the Wellington Downtown Ministry uh, coordinated and they had a really good uh, event where they got a lot of the homeless people and um, uh, they were describing some of the events around that that really um, were designed to support them. So I know other DHBs have also had specific events targeted at getting uh, homeless people vaccinated. Is there any data around that being collected that so we can see the numbers of people, how the outreach is going? Uh, we'll see if we can get that from the DHPs. It may take a few days uh, just because of the, the uh, other priorities at the moment, but we'll work to get that. All right, lucky. Last two, Ben, then Derek, and then we're done. Yeah, on mandatory signing in, as recently as, as late June, the Prime Minister pushed back against this. This was during the Sydney side of Square when Delta was in New South Wales. It's just how it's got here. Why does it take New Zealanders catching Delta for you to announce this policy? Uh, look, we had been working on it for some time already. As I indicated, we were ready to announce that. Um, it was put off, the announcement was put off because of what we dealt with last week. Uh, we have been working on it for some time. There are some difficult legal issues that we've been working through, uh, and including making sure that our COVID tracer, that we, we're not going to lose access to parts of our COVID tracer app because of the commercial arrangements that are in place there. Uh, so we have been working on it for a while. Uh, I just want to ask the, the September, you sort of haven't had, had confirmation. I think quite close to September, is anything that we is there anything that we should be concerned about there? Because usually it's like four weeks in advance, isn't it? Uh, look, I just haven't had that information. It may well be that the team have got a confirmed schedule for September, but we can come back to you on that. Um, and I just wanted to ask about uh, uh, businesses. Obviously, public health officials are stretched, but businesses who haven't heard from public health yet, um, who have had uh, cases confirmed within their, um, among their employees, what's your advice to them uh, if they have to give, you know, tell people in their workplace, give them advice, but they haven't heard from public health teams yet? And it's been like 24 hours. Uh, two, if they if there are cases within a, a business and that has been made um, public, for example, as a location of interest, then I I just ask those businesses yes to tell all their staff, let them know, and um, they can contact either Healthline or the local public the public health unit, likely to be Auckland Regional Public Health, with the information about the staff and contact details and so on would be very helpful. Right, I should go and stretch my legs. I'm sure you'll all have fun with me later. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>